Hello and welcome to this revision podcast on Mr Leaping and his agricultural reforms. So, what situation did he find himself in? There had been a problem in the rural economy up to 1905. Agriculture was a major problem throughout this period, um, between 1855 and 1905, and over 90% of the population lived in small villages in the, this time, in the mid-19th century. Although there were areas of uh, fertile soil, such as the Black Earth areas of Ukraine, much of the land was unproductive and suffered from drought and extremes of temperature. Lack of fertilisers and machineries and field rotation and primitive methods all meant low and unpredictable yields. Many peasants survived by becoming self-sufficient, learning other crafts. But although feudal dues had been abolished in 1861 with emancipation, debts remained after this time. A significant population grew, growth in the second half of the 19th century put even more pressure on land holdings, which reduced in size. This was called land hunger, and before 1900 there were famines. Industry was all, all so backwards, but got more attention from government, particularly after Vita's strategy of encouraging railway building and foreign investment in Russia took off. Agriculture was still being neglected. Apart from being seen as a source of exports to pay for imports or to guarantee foreign loans. There were some impressive industrial gains, although Russia fell further behind still in the European League table, but until 1905 food production only just about kept pace with the rising population, and since grain exports increased considerably, this meant less food for the population, a decline in living standards and even famine. Land captains sometimes enforced payment of debts by brutal means. Peasant discontent became evident in 1905, despite some concessions in 1902, including cancellation of arrears of taxation. Other policies have been put in place, like land banks and the abolition of the poll tax, as well as a largely unsuccessful policy of encouraging peasants to go to Siberia. However, these did not solve the problems of land hunger, a lack of entrepreneurial spirit, and the fact that peasants were still stuck in a semi-medieval state, not now um, beholden to their owner, but to their own mere, who supervised tax collection, gave out passport, and periodically redistributed land, meaning there's no real desire to improve the land or oneself. A few peasants had bought up more land and improved themselves and become kulaks. On another note, some emancipation not even happened by 1881, so rural economy was um, considerably backwards compared to other countries and to industry in Russia as well. Okay, so Stilipin uh, was from an aristocratic family. He was the youngest ever governor in 1902 and an outbreak of rural violence after the famine in 1901 led to commission of agriculture. Stilipin, who was a landowning hardliner and provincial governor, was its most influential member. He kept control during the years of the Red Cockerel in the early 1900s and used an efficient police force to ruthlessly repress revolts. He quickly came to the attention of the Tsar, who appointed him Minister of the Interior before quickly promoting him to the Prime Minister in 1906, replacing Gori Emkin. He is well known for his repression. He said, suppression first and then reform. There had been a resurgence in revolutionary violence in 1906, but by 1907 and in 1907, 1,231 officials and 1,768 private citizens have been killed in terrorist attacks. Salipin put pressure on the press and the unions, 600 unions closed and 1,000 newspapers ceased to publish between 1906 and 1912. And by 1908 assassinations had dropped to 365. Some credit must be taken by Salipin for this. He also dissolved the doomers if they were too radical and he changed the voting law in 1907. In August 1906, he established military court martials for any crime deemed to be political in nature. The trials had to be concluded within two days. The accused was not allowed a lawyer, and many death sentences were carried out. And any death sentences that were carried out had to be done within 24 hours, so there was no time to appeal. Between 1906 and 1909, 3,000 were convicted and executed by these courts leading to the name for a noose in Russia that time being Stolypin's Necktie. Stolypin's programme of harsh repression in the countryside in 1906 and 1907 meant any overt discontent was crushed. Executing the ringleaders ensured any p- 
potential sympathisers in rural areas are silenced. The use of harsh repression destroyed opposition. Many radical leaders were exiled. This helped political stability. And once he got political stability, he began his agrarian reforms. Well, at the same time, really. This involved de-revolutionising the peasantry and satisfying land hunger. One of the reasons the peasants had joined the 1905 revolution is because they believed the government was about to seize the land of those who'd fallen behind in redemption payments. So the outstanding payments were cancelled in 1905, and that was to come into effect in 1907. He strongly believed that Russia needed a prosperous peasantry so that Russia would become richer as a country and more politically stable, so there was less peasant uprisings, and autocracy would then survive. He based his reforms on the few peasants who had improved their lot since emancipation, the Kulaks. He called them the sturdy and the strong, and he's willing to gamble on them. He called it a gamble on the uh, sturdy and the strong. And he do this by providing conditions where more peasants could become Kulaks. Kulaks had a stake, a stake, a vested interest in the status quo in Russia, and would be less likely to cause a revolution, which would a revolution would involve them losing their land. Plus their wealth would mean that they spent more money on goods, stimulating industry as well. So he planned to get rid of the mayor's influence, especially their communal owning of land, which was then distributed to the peasants. This meant that peasants would own their own land and therefore want to improve it, as it would not now get taken them off of them at a later date. The land would pass to the eldest male in the family. Before Stolypin actually even did this, the mayor's responsibility to collect taxes had already been removed in 1903. After 1905, there were more reforms. 1905 law cancelled the remaining redemption payments um, as of 1907 onwards and then when Stolypin became Prime Minister he introduced the Agrarian Reform Act of 1906 permitting peasants to leave the mere, separate their land from the com- commune, consolidate it in one person's hand not, or who would be the head of the household, uh, normally the eldest male, and consolidate it in, into strips of land um, no, from the strips of land into one field to make it more efficient to farm. A new land bank was approved by the Duma and set up in 1910 to help peasants borrow money to buy up land. All state and crown lands were made available to buy up by this land bank, and this was to satisfy the land hunger. There is a renewed effort to get peasants to relocate to Siberia, where land was available. In short, he wanted to encourage a class of well-off, enterpri- enterprising and loyal peasants independent of the mayor who would have a real stake in the Tsarist regime and should be its natural supporters. The effects of change, or these changes. These independent peasants had the freedom to invest in their land, borrowing money from the Peasants' Land Bank in order to implement the latest farming methods and they could also farm previously uncultivated land. So individuals owning their own land went up from 20% to 50% between 1905 and 1914, showing some progress. 3.5 million peasants went to Siberia, turning into one of Russia's main agricultural regions. This contributed to a growth in agricultural output, providing a more stable food supply. However, changes in land took time to process. Peasants in central regions were conservative, and they were reluctant to leave the security of the mere. By 1914, only 10% of land had moved beyond the traditional strip farming. Poorer peasants sold out to richer ones, and this created a poor, alienated landless class, either employed on land or wandering to city, cities to work in factories. So what was uh, Stolypin's relationship with the Duma? He wanted to build a coalition of support with the Duma, but he also wanted to make sure they were compliant. The second Duma opposed his agrarian reforms, and he dissolved them. The third Duma worked with him to pass them. Many of Stolypin's re- reforms were approved by the Duma, uh, the third Duma, but not by the Tsar or the State Council. For example, toleration for Jews, extending the Zemstva to provinces such as Poland, and a lower level of Zemstva. Some of his reforms on health and education, as well as reintroducing magistrates, were passed. However, Stolypin was assassinated in 1911, and many of his policies, particularly agrarian reforms, stalled after his death. Assessment of Stolypin Historians disagree to whether Stolypin's policies would have worked had he lived and had World War I not intervened. 
On one hand, economic reforms and an economic boom contributed to political stability. Stolypin's agricultural reforms helped create a class of more prosperous peasants who were political supporters of the regime. But by 1915, only 22% of households had received individual ownership, although 30% requested it. Mostly in the West and the South, where there's already a tradition of independent farming. Therefore, the agricultural economy on which Russia still depended remained poor, backwards, and progressed at a slower pace in industry. Remember, around four out of five Russians is still a peasant at this point. So, agrarian reforms provided only limited change in agriculture. Only around 10% of peasants left the mere, and even they had had limited capital for investment in modern techniques. In the economy, serious problems remained and led to discontent, which manifested itself in political strikes in the countryside um, as well, and there was widespread unrest, and Salipin's reforms were too slow to bring stability. After 1911, there was increasing evidence that stability was fragile. The Lena Goldfields incident symbolised growing demands for economic change and signalled the wave of strike activity. Strikes in 1912 became increasingly politically motivated. Stolypin said that his reforms would take a generation to work because of his assassination because of World War I, this did not happen. But there are historians who say that they never would have worked in the way Stolypin wanted them to. The amount of peasants applying to leave the mere and consolidate strips into one field dropped off after the initial flurry, suggesting all those who wanted to or could become kulaks had already done so. It also needed a higher growth rate in the industrial sector of the economy to provide jobs to those poorer peasants who had become landless. It also needed to work um, better education and a cultural change in peasants, making desire for self-improvement and um, a need to plan ahead. A plan ahead. Plus, his own government had lost faith in them by 1913, and the main weakness was that they never had complete support of the Tsar, who was under the influence of right-wing factions. Sleepin's death brought celebrations from the left and the right. Perhaps that shows that his policies were the right ones, and he was the last hope for Russia. Unfortunately, the Tsar never trusted him, and appointed Kokovsov and then Goremkin again, both of whom ignored the Duma. Duma.